Well, with me here today to talk about citizen citizenship and what we can do in this country, um, I'm very excited to have with us our next guest, Corey Morgan. Corey is a uh, great uh, columnist. He's an author, and uh, he's with the Western Standard. So a warm welcome to you, Corey Morgan. Great. Thanks, David. Uh, glad to be on. Well, Corey, I um, very much enjoyed reading a number of years ago your book called The Sovereignist Handbook, Charting the Course to Western Independence. So there's a lot to unpack here as it relates to today when we see all kinds of uh, current issues and challenges facing our countries and citizens. And it begs the question in, in my mind um, about many things, including the state of our constitution. And I think that's a, a key thing that you've certainly written about extensively. But Let's talk about our Constitution. How is it biased against Western Canada? Uh, well, where to start? I, I mean, we, we have, uh, for example, I mean, our most powerful legislature among the, the, the houses is, is the Parliament, uh, House of Commons. And it's based on representative representation by population. The Senate, ostensibly, is supposed to help balance that. But again, we've got an, an out-of-date Constitution that has an appointed Senate that isn't actually uh, regionally equal, actually not even slightly close. So when we come to who's going to take power within Canada politically and, and democratically, but uh, if to, to get elected to the House of Commons, of course, you need to pursue the votes where the, the majority of votes are, and that naturally lands in central Canada. It, uh, it forces politicians to maintain a bias towards central Canada with policies, with actions, uh, again, whether they might even uh, not you know, mean to be doing so. But uh, if they want to stay in power, they have to cater to central Canada. And, and that's been the nature of Canada since the West was an agricultural, uh, you know, small uh, factor within confederation to even today when it's a quite powerful uh, block of, of uh, resource rich provinces that are quite well populated and developed, we still tend to find ourselves kind of playing second banana on the legislative front. So it's, it's kind of a frustrating situation as you kind of outline it that way. It does kind of make sense that the constitution is kind of biased and tilted away from Western Canada. So I guess the question is, what can we do about it, Corey? Is there some, an obvious approach there that needs to happen? Well, yeah, and that's some of the frustration. I mean, I, I feel a, a healthy constitution should be a living document. You don't want to be changing it all the time, but it should be updated, refreshed. Uh, you know, the world has changed a heck of a lot in the last hundred and some years. And our last serious attempts to change the constitution were Meech Lake and Charlottetown. Neither of them came even close to coming through. And, and personally, I don't feel those were very radical changes being proposed with those. So if we want to remedy the constitutional issue we have within Canada, uh, the formula for changes is so, the bar is set so high that we would have to hit an actual constitutional crisis of some sort before enough of the country is motivated to tackle that. And I, 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 right. I can't see any crisis other than a province being either right on the brink of secession or having actually voted to in a referendum saying, you know, we've had enough, we're, we're going to move on and, and, and start out on our own. So I've kind of been working towards uh, bringing that, that, that goal about or encouraging people to realize and come to the same conclusion as me. I mean, we're, we're still a long ways from uh, any viable uh, movement for a successful independence vote in the West, but it's growing. And uh, in Quebec, it's been very interesting to watch it uh, flaring up out there again, which again, illustrates how uh, difficult our system is when, when we have regions so discontent within the, the Confederation. Indeed. So why does this issue matter to Canadians? Is there a lot of money flowing out of the West to the, uh, the rest of the country? And quite frankly, it undermines our standard of living or how does this really impact Canadians? Yeah, well, on the economic front, uh, I mean, the, the Western independence movement is, is very economic based. I mean, when you look on the surface it just uh, if you're going to coldly look at it from an economic point of view, we aren't doing very well and being well served within Confederation. Equalization, transfer programs, uh, the way the civil service is set up, the way EI is set up, the way pension is set up, we pretty much kind of get a, a bad return on our dollars on every front. Uh, it's been hundreds and hundreds of billions sent to Ottawa just through equalization alone uh, without a, a return in services. Or I, I know that 
equalization. We don't technically send money to, to them, but we send money to Ottawa through taxes and we don't get them transferred back because the equalization program doesn't uh, allow for that in Alberta. Uh, so on that economic front, and, and people dependent, I guess, provinces dependent on that equalization, if it, the flow dried up, uh, yeah, it would have a negative impact upon them. But it, that gets to the economic question, though. Has equalization really been helping those provinces? Have the Maritimes really gotten a lot stronger due to transfer payments or preferential EI standards for collection and things such as that? Or is it actually kept them in a rut when perhaps they should have been developing other industries or moving to where the industries have developed. But but to the point, it is interesting. When we think of, well, say good public policy, one of the things that we value, of course, is accountability and transparency, simplicity, if you will. Um, and we think of equalization payments, I think there's probably all, a handful of people that even understand this complex formula. What I find fascinating is that the formula doesn't take into account hydro revenues, but it does take into account oil and gas revenues. Isn't that kind of unfair? It's absolutely unfair. And uh, I mean, some of the justification, which I, I find kind of odd and absurd, is that the, you know, the hydro, they say, well, it's because it's not a non-renewable resource, it's, it's ongoing. Well, again, that, that tells me we should be, <laughs> you know, making the most out of the non-renewable ones uh, and, and accepting that they've got a solid, constant, long-term revenue base from the hydro. It's a, a very... It's a very good example of where policy and and such has been, uh, again, stacked to serve Central Canada, where they have abundant hydro resources, and, and uh, Western Canada doesn't have those. So, you know, they, they're taking the money in, and they don't have to sign it up as saying uh, that they collected it, I guess, when they make their welfare application, and, and uh, they can take the full amount. It's, it's just... Uh, uh, even if you agree with equalization, it's not a fair setup for it. Yeah. So fairness is, is really an important question here. So I can understand where you're coming from on these very important questions. So speaking of provinces then in the West, um, do you think then the strategy then of, frankly, increased fairness is for those provinces in Western Canada to demand, frankly, the same amount of powers and treatment as a province called Quebec. In other words, part of the strategy is to, uh, to put a crassie to pull a Quebec. And, and if they have a separate pension system, if they have a separate way of going about things, um, the rest of us should say us too. Well, yes, absolutely. And, and that's, we've been watching that in action. Premier Smith and, and Premier Mo actually have been quite uh, outspoken in defense of a Western interest lately, much more than we've seen in a long time with the Sovereignty Act and things such as that. And you get to see that double standard with the establishment when the things that Alberta is asking for, as you said, with a provincial police force, a pension plan, things such as that, we're not asking for anything that other provinces don't already enjoy. Yet somehow we are, we're immediately labeled as selfish and, and mean-spirited and and uh, being unreasonable when we ask for these things. And people forget, well, Ontario has their own police force. Quebec has their own pension plan. Why, why is it wrong for us to ask for those things out there uh, you know, for, for ourselves that, that they're enjoying in the East? And again, it shows that that divide, even if it's not conscious. You see it, again, through legacy media, through politicians. Albertans are the bad guys when they ask for uh, these things, and, and uh, Quebec is entitled and has the right to do so when they do. And, and that's what tends to infuriate a lot of people on the ground. No, those are excellent points, uh, Corey. So as we reflect on the state of affairs in 2024, um, you know, we look at what seems to be a consistent heavy-duty pattern of the federal government really intruding in provincial lanes of, of constitutional jurisdiction and really attack on, on many parts of Western Canada's economy, including the oil and gas sector. I mean, it's pretty stunning. So um, are you seeing the same pattern, Corey, from your, your point of view? Yeah, and you know, we expect it from the oil and gas. That seems to have just been the trend from liberal governments ever since Pierre Trudeau was in. Uh, again, the irony was they benefit quite well from the, the extraction of these resources. The whole country does. But they, they just seem to uh, loathe it at the same time and, and, and try to put as many uh, uh, blockages ahead of us. I mean, the emissions cap is very, very distressing and, and worrisome for uh, uh, conventional energy producers in Western Canada. Uh, at, the, at the same time, 
when you get in the intrusions into provincial jurisdiction, we're seeing it all over and chronically, whether it's the announcements of a dental plan. And uh, it's like they're setting political traps for our provincial leaders. Uh, Premier Smith is not, you know, Justin Trudeau announces a great big expensive dental plan for people. Premier Smith says, well, we don't want to jump into that plan. In fact, it's healthcare, it's provincial jurisdiction. We have provincial plans for that. Transfer us the money and we could, uh, uh, you know, enhance our, our services that way, but uh, we're not taking part. Well, then she gets labeled as, as again, being insensitive, being overly politicized or being idealistic for turning down money that, you know, Justin Trudeau is handing out to us. It's it's a, a recipe for ongoing political battles between the provinces and the federal government. And people aren't asking often enough, well, wait a minute, is it the role of the federal government to bring in provincial dental plans? Is it the role of the federal government to bring in lunch exactly. bag programs for children or, you know, a lot of these or, or housing uh, transfers? A lot of these things, again, they, they aren't the turf of the federal government. And once they're mm-hmm. entrenched, uh, well, they, then they've got more actually direct control over us out here, and, and it's a, a problematic uh, trend. Yeah, so why? what's your hypothesis then, Corey, of why the federal government is so consistently getting out of their lane and going into provincial responsibilities? Why is that? It's a trend of authoritarianism. You, you want control. It's, it's in the nature, I think, of people who rise up in governments, unfortunately. To be honest, in Alberta, we're seeing it on a different level where Premier Smith is going into some pretty pitched battles with mayors into municipal jurisdiction. No, I, I, I think that's a very good point, Corey. So I like your vision mm-hmm. that the levels of government should kind of mind their own business and do their work well. But the provinces need to empower local governments to do their business. And and to me, that's a very important principle, isn't it, is that we have subsidiarity, the notion that uh, power and authority should be as close to the people as possible. Like, what does Ottawa know about our lives? Not, Not much, do they? No, absolutely not. And as we said, to be fair, and I, I'm, I'm a, quite a, a fan of the UCP government to a degree anyways, but I'll still be critical of them at times. It's just that they, they just can't seem to resist themselves and in, in, in going into different areas. You know, when I'm looking in Alberta, Calgary's needs are going to be much different than the needs of northern Alberta and Grand Prairie. And Grand Prairie's needs are going to be much different than the small town in Tabor in southern Alberta. The best way to serve those needs is, again, is to give as much local authority as you possibly can to the people who are there. Right and the, and they haven't been doing that, uh, not as much. And and I know some people point out there's been some terrible municipal governments. Sure, and there's been some terrible premiers, but it should be the voters remedying that, not the next level of government up. So if voters are engaged and empowered, they can fix these problems rather than having big government come in and say that they're going to fix it on their behalf. Without open discussion and debate, you're not thinking, nor are you free. Comment below. We'd love for you to join the conversation.